Welcome to Soul Searching, the Soul Recruitment Podcast, where we tackle all sorts of great topics in the areas of recruitment, job searching, mindset, technology, marketing, culture, and lots more. It's amazing what you'll pick up. Thanks for joining me. Welcome back, everybody. It's another episode of Soul Searching, the Soul Recruitment Podcast. I'm very excited. It's Tech Series Part 3 with the fantastic Zach Levy. How are you doing, Zach? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very well. Thanks for joining me. And for everyone out there, or the techies out there in particular, we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of a multi-cloud environment. I'm going to be throwing all the buzzwords at you today, so enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) So for everyone out there that doesn't know Zach, Zach is a well-trained, highly experienced IT professional with a rare combination of technical, commercial, and legal expertise. He has more than 30 years' experience in the IT industry and has held numerous executive positions with corporations in Australia and overseas. Zach also used to own and run his own cloud professional services boutique practice, that was subsequently sold to an international management consulting firm. Currently, Zach is a partner of Deloitte, where he leads a team of cloud practitioners and helps commercial and public sector organizations with adopting cloud solutions. He is extremely passionate when it comes to technology. According to him, it's both his profession and his hobby. He is a big believer in the cloud and disruptive innovation, and he's excited to be part of today's digital economy. So, Zach Levy, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good to be here. Pleasure. So, man, 30 years you've been in this business. It's been a long time, yes. It's been a long time. I always say I didn't pick technology. Technology picked me. Nice. Yep. When was the, what was your first introduction into technology? When did you realize, ah, oh, this is going to be my life? So, it was my 13th birthday. Wow. And... Um, um, and my parents asked me what I want as a present for my birthday. It was a very special birthday. And, and I said, I want a computer. And that was an Apple IIc. Uh, the screen was about it. that big and it yep. was green, yep. green and black. I know it well. Um, and um, that, that just shows how old I am. And um, <laughs> I, taught, I taught myself how to code. I bought a book yep. and I learned how to write code in, um, in MS-DOS. Wow. And, um, and uh, I had a friend who was a, a geek just like me and we bounced off each other. And that's where my passion for computers and, and gadgets started. And then um, I pretty much um, made my parents um, upgrade my, my setup um, every, every year, every birthday. <laughs> no. um, and then um, I'm originally from Israel. So I joined, I joined, I joined the army and that's where I was, I was officially trained for the first time professionally. Wow. Um, so I, I joined the, the, the tech division and um, I, I dealt with mainframe operations. Oh my God. Um, so again, centralized computing, but, but um, over, over 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and then again, very keen desire to, to go into the private sector, uh, which I did, but um, I only lasted for about um, three, four months because they, they put me in the basement and made me cut code in the dark and I'm more of a people oh. person. So I made a bit of a pivot. I shifted a little bit and went to study law. Um, and then after a year with a commercial law firm, I, I put a, my passion with my then profession. So I went to work as an in-house legal counsel for tech companies. Nice. That's where I got exposed to startups and raising money and, and doing tech contracts. And that was during the, the dot-com boom in the 2000s and um, I had an amazing experience working for a, an incubator accelerator with startups and helping them um, and that's really my passion for tech and innovation and using technology grew so um, I really wanted to do a, a, a master's degree and, 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 and try to get more deeper into the tech and business side rather than the legal side yep. Legal makes you feel like you sit on the sidelines and you give people advice about risk, but you don't really get involved. That's I wanted to get involved. So that's, um, that's how I ended up in Australia. I ended up coming, coming to Australia and, and doing a master's degree uh, in Macquarie in business and, and international relations. I ended up doing double masters. And, and, that's, and then my, um, I worked for a startup for a bit and then I worked for Telstra. So that was my introduction to 
Australian enterprise technology. Yeah. I worked on the dedicated Qantas account. And that was, um, and then I had a couple of roles in Telstra. And then I moved to a boutique, um, a startup. They, they were called Bluefy and they did cloud before it was called cloud and was very sexy. So data center hosted services. Is that what they called it back then? Just data center hosted services? Data center hosted services, yes. Right. Okay. And, cool. and ironically enough, that was 2004, 2005. Right. And again, this is where, you know, the market shifted. When I just learned tech, in uh, 1993 and we worked with mainframe computer everything was centralized yep. we only had screens and keyboard that would log into a computer that was centralized we all logged into the same machine and then everything went to the pcs you know the apples and the That's windows right. machines yep. so everything became distributed um, and then with data center hosted services it's back to the future it's everyone went back to centralized and this is where we're at today with cloud everyone logging in to a centralized, yeah, uh, full everything circle. centralized again, full circle. Yeah, that's crazy when you think history that. repeats itself. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, I worked for a small, uh, a small boutique, almost a startup. We did data center hosted services. We did it quite well. We grew. We did well. We were acquired by Dimension Data at the time. Yeah. That turned into a cloud business unit. Again, amazing journey over seven years with amazing people. Learned a lot, but again, got into data center multi-tenanted software, everything centralized, delivering as a service, uh, building products that you deliver as a service, trying to innovate, compete against the big ones with very little, makes you think outside the box and you know be innovative and disruptive. Um, and then trying to do that as part of that mentioned that I then moved on um, and joined an organization called Reckon. Yep. They are famous for doing um, accounting software and software for accountants. And again, help them with their journey to the cloud. So move from software that's installed on servers and desktop to everything centralized. And that was an amazing journey working with amazing people. Um, and then um, again, my passion was stronger than me. Uh, that's where I discovered AWS in uh -huh. 2012, when they just switched on the region in Australia, I helped Reckon adopt and, and change and transform. So they're a cloud organization and I really fell in love with the concept and wanted to do that for a living. So I got together with a couple of guys who started a business that was a, a mixed digital business. And then we got into business together and turned it, it was called Strut Digital into a 100% AWS business. Wow. Um, and we did quite well. We worked very closely with AWS, helped a lot of clients, did some amazing stuff with the cloud in the early days. Amazon, AWS in Australia wasn't a monstrosity then. It was a small team of people. We worked very closely with them. It was good fun. And then we popped up on Deloitte's radar and um, they've acquired us in 2017. And I've been with Deloitte ever since. That's a hell of a ride. Yes. <laughs> one hell of a ride. Yes. It's one hell of a ride. And you're still as passionate about technology and cloud as you ever were. Absolutely. It's, um, I think it's, it's a lot more mainstream today, but that's just um, accelerated the investment yeah. and proliferation of cloud technologies. So everyone today, whether us as individuals, small businesses, large enterprises, public sector, we now have at our fingertips and our disposal so many more powerful tools that we can experiment with, have a penny drop moment, um, tear it down, start again, or adopt it wholeheartedly yep. without the consequences of investing millions. In the past, I mean, a lot of that stuff has been around for many years, but it wasn't accessible. Yep. It was expensive. It was hard to get access to and implement. Now, it's at our fingertips. Yeah. It's actually quite crazy when you think about it. Technology in the cloud has changed industries and has given birth to totally new industries just because of the capability of the technology. And it's moving now more rapidly than it ever did. It's quite scary. Yes. Such an exciting time to yeah. such exciting time to be around and be in that space. So I, I feel quite fortunate. Ah, oh, fantastic. Now it took us ages just to get a head around what the cloud was. Yes. Now we've got multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. Maybe explain to everybody what exactly those terms mean. The, and that is a, a really, really good question because. It's not uncommon. Cloud is now a buzzword and people yep. throw that around. I've, I've, I've even heard about cloud recruitment and cloud people. There's cloud everything. Because yep. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a buzzword and, and people are attracted to it and use it um, very loosely. But the concept of, of, of 
and it's important that we'll speak the same language because you could have a conversation and two people use the same words, but they mean different things. Absolutely. So cloud is a, it could be a lot of things depending on the context of the conversation. But when you use Gmail on your phone, you use the cloud. You actually log in remotely to something that is centralized. Yep. And it's built in, the term is multi-tenancy, but it's built in a way that a lot of people can use it at the same time. But you have an individual experience. Gotcha. So it's right over there yep. and we can access it, consume it. And normally cloud comes with a commercial model that is also very easy to understand. So it could be the utility model, you know, the mobile phone. We no longer, you know, we just pay for what we use. You don't, you don't have to install a whole mobile network to be able to call me. That's right. <laughs> we just rent a little tiny bit of it, but all of us can do it together. The same utility model applies to cloud computing. Gotcha. That term has evolved and grown in recent years. So in the past, um, a lot of it was about infrastructure as a service. That's where AWS and Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud mm -hmm. have, have, have become famous. So instead of buying your own servers with compute and storage and networking, you just rent what they give you. You log into it remotely, you use virtualization, you build it, and then it started getting more sophisticated. So you have services that sit on top. So when you use them remotely, um, um, that's cloud. You have the most basic level, which is infrastructure as a service, yep. building blocks, compute, storage, yep. right. networking. Then you've got what sits on top of it is platform as a service, things that utilize the basics and you can also rent it. So platform as a service. And then you've got what sits on top of it is software as a service. Crazy, yeah. So cloud is a generic word for everything, but those are the basic fundamentals. And there's a lot of things that happen on the edges um, that platforms build on top of platforms that give you instantaneous capability without the need to build. If the, in the past you had to take it and build it, now you can access it. So, um, so for example, Salesforce is also cloud, but we use terminology around it. With Salesforce, you do a lot more configuration than customization. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, in terms of multi-cloud or hybrid cloud, if we look at the infrastructure as a service layer, so you can buy your infrastructure, your virtual servers and your storage and your networking from Amazon, or you can buy it from Microsoft Azure, or you can buy it from GCP. Or Alibaba. Or Alibaba, that's right. There's others, but those are the prominent ones. Um, um, and there's Oracle Cloud as well. There's, oh, there's I didn't few, know that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oracle, got, they've got their own offering. Oh. Um, but, um, but again, multi, I mean, we all use multi-cloud. You use multi-cloud. Like I could Microsoft use Gmail cloud. and I could use something else and then I'm using two Correct. clouds, I suppose. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but if we talk about infrastructure as a service, um, it's, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Right. Um, so multi-cloud is when you use more than one provider to perform a function. So multi-cloud is a very interesting conversation um, and, and it's got different pros and cons, whether we talk about the infrastructure as a service, a platform as a service, or software as a service that sits on top of that. Gotcha. And now we've also got infrastructure as code, which fits into that as well at some point. Infrastructure as code is how you use those platforms. Right. So gotcha. if in the past, um, programmers used to use code to write software, right. and then you had to install the software on servers or desktop, which are the infrastructure, mm -hmm. Um, today, because it's all accessible remotely, it's also accessible programmatically. Gotcha. So you can actually write code that doesn't only, it's not only the software that perform functions, but it also operationalizes the infrastructure at the same time. Amazing. Yep. And that is what we call a full stack developer that write code that does everything from the infrastructure to the platform, to the software that sits on top of it. Gotcha. Love it. And so before we dive in further, because I want to dig in a bit further from a technical point of view, but if a company or an organization is starting to think about their journey to the cloud, whether it's yes. a smaller one or a larger one, yes. what should they be thinking about before they even decide which cloud provider to use, which cloud platform to use, et cetera, et cetera? Great question. Um, the thing is, the most important things when you adopt the cloud is to make sure that you're clear on why you're doing that. Right. There's a need. There's a there's a there's something that 
pushes you to have to make a change yep. and you're adopting the cloud because you want to do something different. Now, most of the common, you either, if it's infrastructure driven, you may want to save money. So cost saving and being operationally more efficient, that is a very legitimate driver. Um, you could um, want to improve the customer experience. Um, the infrastructure, everything that I do is the customer experience is not that pleasant. I hear that by adopting the cloud, I can be, I can help use tools that the more, um, more the, the customer experience is a much more pleasant. But personally, I look at it from a disruption lens. And I put customers that come and have that conversation in one of three buckets. Okay. Um, either you've been you've been around in an industry for a long time, and now the industry has changed. There's new players coming. They haven't been around for that long. They're using innovation. They're nimble. They're agile. They do things really quickly. They're disrupting your industry, and you need to respond. Definitely. They're doing things quicker, faster, and you have to respond. You can be smarter and then you've been an established player in the industry. You can see the writing is on the wall that new players are coming. You're preempting that. You're going to say, I'm going to innovate. I'm going to do things better for my clients because if I'm not going to do it, some young exactly. crowd going to come and disrupt my business, right? I they, want say, to they say, let's disrupt ourselves before someone else disrupts us. Correct. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah. Um, the third lens is you're the disruptor. You want to go into a new industry and you want to make some waves and you want to change things. People were complacent, making super margin, delivering their customers with the same experience all the time. I want to do things differently. Nice. So I look at customers in this particular way because, and then it breaks down to more, but it's really important to identify right at the beginning why you're doing what, what you're doing because that's your Northern star. You want to make sure that you realize those benefits from the beginning. And then you start planning. Whether you're a small organization or large organization, migrating to the cloud, it's disruptive. It's risky, often expensive. Yeah, time consuming. Time consuming. Um, because some, depending on the size and complexity of the organization, um, for even for a medium-sized organization, it's not uncommon for that to take months. Wow. And you have to do that in parallel to running your business. It's not that you can go to your clients and say, excuse me, customers, I'm going to pause my business for the next nine months until I'm, right. migrating. I'm migrating to the cloud. I'll be back. <laughs> that doesn't work. You, you yeah. still have to run your business the same way and not impact your customers, yeah. but you want to migrate to the cloud. So before you do that, you want to make sure that you switch on the torch in the tunnel before you take your first step. Otherwise, you may stumble and may even fall. Yeah, definitely. So the planning is very important. Make sure that you know what you're moving because a lot of organization has been ac accumulating technology and tech debt for many years. And I can, I can promise you, we've helped a lot of clients in, in that exact journey. And you always, when you scan your environment, you always find things that you didn't know they were there and I'm things sure. that you thought they were there, they're no longer there. I'm sure. And it looks very different. It's it's like looking into a cupboard that you haven't opened in quite a few years. You find the <laughs> yeah. So you don't want to move something across and then find out that it breaks everything. So um, do do a good audit of what you've got and plan what it's going to look like on the other side and make sure that it aligns with your with your ambition with your northern star. Nice. So I'm going to translate my migration to anything from operational efficiencies to better customer experience or more agility. I want to I want to be able to do things faster. Once you've planned, then make sure that you have a really good plan on how to implement, how to migrate. Because although a lot of organizations got really competent technology teams, they don't do migrations for a living. They do whatever it is that they do for a business as a living. Right, yeah. So pick a good partner that will help you take their safely, do it once, do it properly. Um, and, uh, um, and, and make sure that, again, you stay loyal to the planning, the timelines, the costs, the, 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 the things that you'll do in the process to get there. Make sure you engage your people. Tell them the change is coming. And once you move to the cloud, the way that you run your environment is very different to the way that you used to run it before. 
use that time to get prepared. Because once you move things to the other side, there needs to be someone to catch it That's right. and run it. And if it's different and your people don't have those skills, make sure that they've got those skills. And if it takes longer for them to pick up those skills than the items that move to the other side, make sure that you find someone who will help you in the interim until your people are self-sufficient. Awesome. So you also have to think about your run while you, while you do all that. And that actually brings up two interesting points while I'm listening to you. It's fascinating. I mean, would you say that if you're a smaller organization, don't partner with a massive cloud provider that deals with enterprise level clients or enterprise level projects and vice versa, or that doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. Um, so if you look at the hyperscalers, yep. um, they can cater for really small businesses yep. and really large organizations. Okay. Um, it's, it's really building blocks and basic services. And it's all about how you put them together um, in order to deliver the solutions and the tools and the outcomes that you need for your organization and your clients. If you're a small organization, that your benefit is you can make decisions more quickly. You can adopt the technology more quickly. Yeah. You can become self-sufficient more quickly. Sure. And you can get the benefits more quickly. And the whole project will be faster and more agile. Correct. Yep. If in my experience, whether you're smaller size or, or larger size, if there's one thing that I've learned and, and one of the, again, things that I enjoy doing what I do, um, again, whether you're in tourism or in retail or professional services, you have a business that focus on doing what it is that you do best. It's unlikely that you'll do cloud migrations or cloud adoption really well. Pick a partner, pick a partner that you trust, you have good relationship with and use them to help you get there and, um, and, 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 and just do it once, but do it properly. Nice. And if you partner with them well, it works. No fails. Beautiful. And trust their knowledge and experience because they've done this. Absolutely. They so do this day in, day out. Go, go through the due diligence process. Make sure that you find someone that you find competent but you also trust you can engage in a meaningful way. Like even if they're professionals, but you don't gel and you can't trust them and you can't develop good working relations, you'll need that because you will rely on them to move you to the cloud and they will rely on you because after all, it's your business, not theirs. They're just getting to know the systems. That's it's right. your business. So if you guys don't work hand in hand, bringing the expertise and the intimate business knowledge together, there's less chances that it's going to work with that hiccups good point and it's when that true partnership happens that's when projects go flawlessly love it and that's when you get synergistic effects you, you get a result that's even better than what you both dreamed of one plus one equals three that's what happens and and it. and the thing is when you do those projects because they're complicated technically complicated operationally complicated people are involved like anything you've got good days where things go your way and you've got bad days when things don't go as planned right so genuine partnership relationship are not being judged by your best day. They're being judged by your worst day. Yeah, very true. <laughs> and if you've got genuine partnership, it's not going to turn into a finger pointing exercise and you're not going to go and look at your liability terms in your contract. You're going to go, oh, we ended up, we didn't expect this, but what are we do, going to do? How can we work together to learn from this experience and get to the other side? Um, and um, I've seen I've seen that many times since when you've got genuine partnership, yeah. cloud adoption works really well. Love it. And I and the other thing that it really brings up to me is even doing a few other podcasts about tech. I've learned how important the integrity of your data has to be. Oh. If you don't get your data right before you even start this process, what are you migrating? Um, that, so, so data is what sits on the infrastructure. And, and, and again, just because you move it to the cloud, it's not going to make it better That's right. or, or, or more trustworthy. So um, you got to, when you do this, one of the most important thing, you've got to maintain the integrity of the data. Yep. But the, one of the benefits is once you get to the cloud, you've got access to so many tools that helps you a lot more with dealing with that data. So you can cleanse things in a different way. And if it was crap before, when you move it across, it's still going to be crap, yeah. but um, you'll have the ability and the tools to structure it better, cleanse it, make sure that there's some validation. So when new data is being generated, 
Nice. Um, it's the, it's my, so you've you got, you got a lot more options to deal with the data that is stored okay. in the cloud. So do the best you can to keep your data as clean as possible, but all is not lost. When you, when you have migrated it, you can still do some more work after that. And, and protect it. So data, it's, it, you know, backup and protecting data has always been a challenge. Yep. It's a lot easier when, when you're on the cloud, but it's still a thing that is very important that you've got to think of from day one. Absolutely. I mean, that's another whole topic which I want to get into on this podcast too, security and backup and everything else. Security and backup, yes. But I want to jump into the topic of today just to clarify a little or to dig a little deeper into multi-cloud versus non-multi-cloud. Yeah. When so, are there times when people should definitely use multi-cloud and are there times when that's just not what you need? Um, so, so that is a very individual question um, and there's a lot of answers, but let's think about, for example, infrastructure as a service. Yep. Um, yes, there are things that are pretty much commodity. So virtual servers are virtual servers. If you log into a virtual service on Microsoft Azure, it's exactly the same as if you log into a similar server on AWS or Google Cloud. Right. Um, but part of the benefit of adopting a, a, a hyperscale platform for your infrastructure is the ecosystems or services that sits around those basic building blocks. There's so many tools yeah. that makes your life easier and make you more efficient around those basic building blocks. And those are slightly different. Right. So if you commit to a platform and you start using infrastructure as code and automation and train your people, if you are committed to a platform, it is so much easy to milk the benefits of those ecosystems of tools. Uh -huh. Hi, guys. Just a quick message. I'm always on the lookout for engineers in the managed services space across Australia. Support engineers, systems engineers, network engineers, and solution consultants. I only work with the best companies that are going places, really value their staff, have great techs, and offer stacks of training and other benefits up to $1,000 for successful referrals. Who do you know? Feel free to give me a buzz, 0414-659-800. But right now, back to the conversation. To make, you, to make your infrastructure substantially more efficient, streamlined, agile than what it was when it was on-prem or when you had on data center. Gotcha. If you do this across Microsoft Azure and AWS, you have to abstract yourself from the platform, deal with it as commodity, and then you really can lose a lot of the benefits that sit in the ecosystems of tool around the infrastructure. Makes sense. Yeah. If you, let's say, invest in, so let's say you're in the insurance business and compliance and security is extremely important. You have to build controls that protect everything where you host it, and you will use native high platform services to build those controls. If you're multi-cloud, you've got to build those controls. Let's say you use GCP and AWS. Mm -hmm. You've got to start building those controls both on GCP and on AWS and then make them work with each other. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. It seems like a, a, a quite a complicated process. Correct. So you really got to look at um, what are your drivers to consider multi-cloud? Is this because you don't trust one hyperscaler for have outages and you want to rely on another? Mm -hmm. And if that, if you gain that certainty, does that outweigh the inefficiencies and the extra overhead associated with making your infrastructure run on both? Or you trust their track record enough to commit to one platform? However, that becomes a little bit less of an issue as you start climbing up the stack and move from infrastructure as a service, to platform as a service, to software as a service. Because yep. um, you have certain platform services that are a lot more programmatically accessible and the overhead associated with using um, one platform for your infrastructure, but maybe I can use another platform for some other things that are not exactly infrastructure. So I will use AWS for my infrastructure as a service because the ecosystems tools, they are great and the cost for what I need is awesome. But for integration and identity, I'm really a Microsoft. So I'm gonna use Azure integration services and Active Directory as a service for Microsoft. But um, for email, I really like 
Google Cloud. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I really like um, you know G Suite or, or or Google Workspaces. So I'm going to use that. So effectively, so you're using three you now. Commit, you use all three. You committed wow. to AWS for your infrastructure. And you're really milking the benefits there. You're already in the Microsoft ecosystem using Azure Active Directory, and for email, you try and those are built to you. So multi-cloud can have a lot of pros and a lot of cons, but you really got to use it. Why? Go back to the why. What's your northern star? Why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. And then plan and then implement. And multi-cloud could be could be a good option, but if you're not, if it's not meeting your real needs, it could be a really bad option. Nice. Wow. I tell you, there's so much more to it than when you think. <laughs> and and so for example, if you look at the major financial institutions, they're regulated. Right. Um, so in the past, AFRA. Uh, which is the regulator body for financial services, they used to say, you need to have your infrastructure in more than one data center because it's important customer record by law, by regulation. You've got to have data center redundancy. Gotcha. The whole concept of data center redundancy is not as relevant anymore when you use hyperscale platforms. So the recommendation or the, the requirement now from the regulator is use multi-cloud. Uh -huh. And that puts the large financial institutions sometimes in a little bit in a bit of a pickle because they need to um, comply with the regulations for certain use cases, which means that they got to lose some of the efficiencies and put more effort in making sure that what runs across both clouds is not too dependent on the platform services, and you can actually do that. So um, the why is really important. Right. So in that example, you are forced to go multi-cloud purely by law. You have no choice. Yes. It's more regulations, but oh. yes. Okay. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And I suppose, you know, even though a company or an organization is going to be using a cloud provider to help them with this transition, what do they have to do to make sure their own staff or their own teams are upskilled enough to handle this? during and after the project is, is finished. That is extremely important. By the way, that presents a huge opportunity and is already is for a booming you know, tech um, labor market in, in, in Australia and all over the world. But um, it is extremely important um, and not always the first thing that organization think about. Yeah. Um, again, one thing that I've learned and proves right every time, technology is predictable. It will do what you will tell it to do. Sure. If you made a mistake, you won't do it properly, but it is predictable. People, not so much. So an organization that moved things to the cloud, like I mentioned before, they run very differently on the cloud than when they run in traditional environment. And, um, and so it's really important that from the beginning, when you plan your journey to the cloud, you also take into consideration how do I change the skills that I've got within the organization to be able to run the cloud from the first day that I need to? Wow. That means your IT team that in the past needed skills in a particular area, now they need to update their skills to include the cloud. And your roadmap to the cloud, in your technical roadmap to the cloud, and your operational roadmap to the cloud will also need to include your people. Yeah, communicating sure. the changes to them and having a plan out to upskill them and again, it's not uncommon for, um, for the infrastructure and the applications to move to the cloud faster than what you plan than your people. Yeah. So it's important to find someone to help you on the journey and help you run that environment while your people learn how to do it. And one of the things that I believe in and, 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 and a lot of customers that are we work with um, really appreciate is um, help organizations and teams pick up the new skills through doing. Nice. Get them involved. So if you're a partner and you're helping your client, you bring your experience, you bring your tools, you bring your methodology to make their journey to the cloud safe, planned, secure, um, and, 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 and cost-effective, involve the people that would be involved in running it. Yep. Yep. Bring them on from the beginning in the, from the, beginning, the project. 
from the beginning, get them involved. So if, if you, as the partner, if you've been asked, um, dear partner, help babysit some of the cloud workloads until <laughs> we're ready. Yeah. Um, then we involve, we involve the client IT team as they go through the training and the upskilling, we get them involved. In the beginning, they're in the background, they're shadowing, they're, they're looking. And when they get to a particular maturity, they really get involved and they, they lead. And when they get to the right level of maturity, we exit and we let them run the environment themselves. And a lot of the things that happen throughout that process, now that organization have access to all those tools, they start questioning, why do we need to put so much effort into infrastructure as a service and, and deal with the infrastructure. We should invest our people and get their skills to be much higher up the value chain. We'll get partners to do infrastructure, run our infrastructure because that's the same for everyone. They can yep. probably do it cheaper and better. Yep. And that's I'll basically really managed services, yes. Correct. Yep. And I'll get I'll get my people reskill. I've already need to train them. I'll train them on things that are a lot more value add yeah. to my business. Great. Um, and again, that create opportunities, that's part of the change that you described before, the create opportunities for everyone. Um, and again, people within organization, they learn their skills go up the value chain and MSPs get more clients that, that want help with running their environment. And actually on that point, if you work with a cloud provider to go through this transition, do they, or some of them, would they actually help you train your internal staff? Does that, does that come along with the package sometimes? Um, to a degree, it does, and different providers do it in different ways. Um, but um, a lot of it is, think about it as generic training. Right. You, can get certi you can get certified and you can get accredited, and that will teach you how to run the environment and use the tools. It's, it's like anything new that... that any new tools. If in the past it used to be um, NetApp storage that you had to install it in your data center, now AWS, you know, you do a, an architect professional and it teaches you how to deal with storage in, in, in the cloud. But you have to, as a, as a business owner and a leader in an organization, you've got to take that to the next level and think, how do I not only upskill my people, but I put an operating model that is more efficient to my business. Take those cloud benefits and translate them to business benefits. Nice, yeah. Um, so, so that's the whole point of using the cloud. That's you're right. Now a big, you're a more agile business, there are business benefits. So you gotta take, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta find a way to create a training plan that is unique to organization. And again, aligned with the Northern Star, with those benefits that you're looking to get. Right, right. And what about in terms of the training and the certification that we were just discussing? Like a lot of my um, candidates and engineers that I speak to every day, they'll always ask me, you know, what should I do to get ahead? What, what training should I do? Which cloud platform should I, which certification should I do, et cetera, to help me get that dream job? Yep. So, so, so my, my response or advice for that would be absolutely get those certifications, 100%. They, and keep them up to date. Right. For, for tech professionals, that is a testament to your knowledge, your expertise, and your investment in your profession. 100% they're important. It's less important which one. Yeah. It's more important that you'll have one. Okay. And if you find an area that, um, that you enjoy and you want to specialize in, go deeper. Most, most platform will, get, will, will give you a foundational level cert and then another level cert and you can you can specialize as very deep very broad those though as the ecosystems of services grow so would the certifications yeah. and as things grow you almost have to specialize because you can't be across everything you can't you're not a computer. however however and and th that has always been across tech professional in in my experience and it's no different um, some people prefer to go deep yep. and some people prefer to go wide. Fair enough. And I've noticed, I've seen in the teams in tech professionals, some say, I want to specialize in a particular cloud platform. So let's say AWS, and they go and they gain as many certifications as they can within the AWS. So that's their area of passion or that's their area of ex chosen expertise. On the other hand, there are those that take pride in 
I'm a technology professional and I can help you figure out what's the right way to do things irrespective of the platform. So they go and they get more foundational or general expertise across multiple cloud platforms. So I know engineers that will have as many as certain as they can within one. And I know that get a few in each. Amazing. Yeah, so they're technology is- agnostic. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, and I mean, um, and these days, I mean, even on Udemy and there's so many different um, platforms out there where you can get very, very cost-effective training on a weekend or a couple of hours and, you know, you can become certified in the basics at least. A hundred percent. And that's even, even though I haven't been cutting code for more years than I'm willing to admit, <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can testify first that experience. I've, I've, done, I've done some of the certifications myself. I've done through a self-service course online through, through I used Udemy in this particular instance. So you, you can definitely do it um, at your own pace, at your own time, in your own means, and, 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 and it works and it's really, really well. The, the, I would still say that there are certain things that you want to learn that are, are probably better experienced through class training, mm-hmm. but many of those certifications you can do at your own time, at your own um, um, at your own pace, and I recommend you would. And I suppose talk to your your employer to help you go on that journey. And if for whatever reason they won't do it or you can't do it, try find a way to do it on your own. You know? I personally think that most most employers today, employ tech professional, will encourage them to update and maintain their, their skills and certification. So absolutely, talk to your employer. I think many will be surprised to hear. Uh, we were surprised to learn that employers will support them. Yeah. But even if they don't, for whatever reason is, invest in yourself. It's worth doing. Yeah. And as we said, it's so cost effective now that, you know, you don't have an excuse not to. Correct. Yeah. And I want to talk about one other little buzzword that's popping, its, popping up or rearing its head lately. And that's serverless technology. Serverless what technology. What the hell does that mean? Serverless technology. So, um, um, In its basic definition, in the past, when you wrote code and you wanted to operationalize it to make it perform a function, you had to install it on a server. Right, sure. So you spin up a virtual server, you write your code, you install it, you run it. You you had to have your server running for that code to run and perform that function. Makes sense. Um, Over time, the hyperscale platform realized that they can actually use unutilized service ca- server capacity and technology to allow you to install code in thin air. Right. So you don't have to make sure that a server is up and running and you pay for a server. Because think about it this way. Sometimes you'll have to spin up a big server to install just a tiny piece of code. So you pay for all that capacity while you only use 10% of it. Right. So it's almost so like have- it's almost like a little you're um, using or utilizing a temporary server or a temporary part of a server. Let, let, me, let me be specific. Let's say you need a function that if, if I drop an image in my Facebook account, yep. you grab it and you store it in your Microsoft drive in the cloud. Perfect. You, need, you, you wrote a piece of code that does it. You, want, you need it to run somewhere. So... But it's, a, it's really efficient. It's really small. So you spin up the smallest server that you can on AWS. But even when it runs, um, it only uses 5%, but you've got to pay for this expensive server. Um, now, if you power off the server and you put an image in your Facebook and the server is not running, you won't be able to perform the function that it needs and copy it and put it in your cloud drive. Oh, yeah. So you need the server running all the time. So you pay for 95% capacity that you don't use. Gotcha, yep. Not very smart, not very economical. No. <laughs> so the hyperscalers came with an option to say, let me let you run code without actually spinning up a server. I'm going to allow you to install it because we've got servers running all the time and sometimes that capacity is not used. So we'll allow your code to run all the time and you only pay when it's actually being used. Gotcha, makes sense. So the card is just sitting there waiting and you're not paying for anything. And all of a sudden you put an image in your Facebook account, the card will go up, oh, there's a new image, will run, copy the image, put it in your cloud drive, stop running. You pay just for that time that you ran. That's oh, it, yep. no more, no less. 
Now, you got a huge benefit because your software can run all the time, but you only pay when it runs. And the hyperscale provider got a lot of benefit because you're now installing all your code on their environment because it's really economical and effective. Yeah. So are a lot of organizations now using serverless or moving towards using some kind of serverless technology? Absolutely. It's a trend. Uh, it's powerful. It's economical. It ties in natively into all the services within the platform. It's sticky. Wow. Um, and it's definitely a really growing trend, um, um, and, and it's here to stay. What do they come up with next? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of area that becomes specialized. Yep. Um, so again, um, you, you move to platforms that sits on top of platforms, and then you, you don't need to build anything. You just configure, and you've got outcomes. So it's, it's crazy when you think about it. Yeah. Wow. Well, Zach, I mean, that's been incredible. I really appreciate such a detailed and thorough journey into this new world. Or it's not so new anymore, but it's just the nuances of what we've, you know, been developing over so many decades. Yes. Um, but where do you think this might go in the future? I mean, I know I'm not asking you to become a fortune teller, but where do you think this might head? What What do you think is next? A cloud. It's the new normal. Yep. So if five years ago, the conversation around organizations and businesses was um, there's this new public cloud, should we, should we not? Have, it says they've got the word public in front of it. Is it risky? Um, those not are the conversations today. The conversations today are about, well, we're not in the cloud, so we're missing something. Yeah. So everyone is now using cloud. Um, new businesses and new offerings, they just, they now born in the cloud. So we now live in the born in the cloud world yep. where the rest of the world is just, is just catching up. So cloud is here to stay. And a good point on that, just to jump in, the new generation of talent is also born into the cloud. Correct. Correct. So the same way that um, kids that were born today and even 10 years ago, they don't know what the phone with the dial is. It's, it's really new to them because they never knew it as a phone. Um, the tech professionals today, a lot of them never had to deal with the physical server. There was no need. They were born into virtualization and directly to serverless. So a lot of those that are learning today, um, they, they learn about this stuff for historical purposes. Yeah. <laughs> but now we're going up the value chain and platforms are being created to make things a lot more accessible and a lot more configurable. So you really use them programmatically without the need for infrastructure. Yeah. Data and analytics are becoming a much more integral part of what we do. So that will play a big, bigger role in today's organization. And that runs on those platforms. Yep. And they offer a platform as a service. So there's organizations like Snowflake and Databricks, and they give you a data and AI platform. So building blocks that you can turn into, they, they make data and AI a lot more accessible, a lot cheaper, a lot more powerful. Just bring your data and we'll help you turn it into insight. Well, and then you don't care if it runs on AWS or Azure because they give you the platform. Um, so, and, 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 and now we're developing an ecosystems of professionals that specialize in data breaks. They, they don't care about the platform, they, the, the infrastructure that it runs on. Databricks sort that out for them. They, they work on, yeah. on top of that. And then what happens now that we've given organizations and businesses outcomes, they don't need to worry about the building blocks. Now specialization moving into industry. We want the outcomes to the industry specific. So there'll yeah. be platforms for healthcare oh and God. platforms for financial services and platforms for retail. So when you get things out of the box, not only they give you outcomes, they give you outcomes that are relevant to your industry. Wow. So it's just going to be more and more, more and more of a sophisticated expression of what we already have. You, you'll get a much more complete outcome out of the box and a lot more efforts to turn it into much, something functional for your business. That's where, yep. that's, that's, that's where the direction seems to be heading. Yep. And it will almost be irrelevant which platform you're on because all these tools and, and software applications will run on any platform anyway. Correct. So here is a new buzzword for you, Darren. Industry cloud. Industry cloud now. <laughs> I love it. So you go to the cloud and there are solutions specific to your industry. That's where the trend is starting to head. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. Well, Zach, I really appreciate it. It's been incredible learning experience for me. 
You've got a way of explaining things in a very simple, um, effective way that I can understand. And I hope the audience, you know, has really enjoyed that as well. A bit of a dive into uh, some of the new technology. Me too. It's uh, been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way they can do that? Um, LinkedIn is probably the best way. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I try to express an opinion every once in a while. Uh, so um, reach out, connect on LinkedIn, send me a message. Love to. Awesome. Love to engage. Oh. Love to broaden the network. I'll make sure that uh, I put all the links in the show notes to LinkedIn. Um, but again, really appreciate you coming on the show. I've enjoyed that immensely, and I hope the audience has as well. Any last words, any last uh, things you want to leave us with? Uh, no, I think, um, again, for me, very exciting times. You know, we live in a digital economy where now cloud is everywhere, used by everyone. And, and again, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for tech professionals. So just embrace it, specialize, and enjoy it. Yeah, and I suppose it also kind of brings up a great point as well. I'm hoping that because of this new technology, because of this, all these new um, avenues, I'm hoping it actually increases the amount of people coming through the IT industry as well. Oh, of course. Because we need that. There's one thing that I can tell you that, that um, um, we really need to, to change. We don't have enough diversity in the tech community. Yeah. And we don't have enough um, women and young women that um, go into the tech professional and I really hope that that will change. That now that it's a lot more proliferated and a lot more exciting stuff, um, I hope that um, we'll have a lot more um, women engineers and women tech professional joining the community. I'd really Absolutely. love Absolutely. I think that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Well done. I love it. Well, Zach, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I thank you once again for your time and that incredible insight into technology of the new age. And um, I, everybody out there, I hope you really enjoyed that as much as I did. We'll be back very, very soon for another episode in our tech series. If you have anything that you particularly want to learn about or want us to explore, please do write in and let me know. And I'll try and put together an episode specially tailored for you. So thanks again, Zach. Really appreciate you coming Thank on the you. show. Thank you. And yeah. uh, everybody have a great day. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Saul Searching, the Saul Recruitment Podcast. If you'd like to join me as a guest on the show, I would be delighted to collaborate. Feel free to buzz me on 0414 659 800 or email me on darren at saulrecruitment.com.au. I'm always on the lookout for great guests who can share their stories and expertise with my community. But for now though, have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time.